Due process, honored for three consecutive years with the Mid-Atlantic Emmy for Outstanding Talk Program Series. Africans and African Americans, the cause to endure the longest running crime against humanity in the world over the last 500 years. And that's the rationale for a controversial plan to in some way offer compensation for those hundreds of years of bondage and bias. Reparations for slavery, pipe dream, or possibility on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for Due Process is made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding is provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual. It's always been an American axiom. You work, you get paid. And paid work is just the beginning. Self-determination, free choice, free will. The precepts on which this country was founded with one important exception. I'm Raymond Brown, and we're talking today about American slavery, which, right from its founding, violated every one of this country's own rules. Now, that's not exactly news, but what may be is the growing demand that the bill, at last, be paid. Reparations for slavery just fair or simply foolish? An idea whose time has come or an idea that has no chance? Both views right here in our studio as the intrepid Stanley Crouch faces off against the always provocative Ron Daniels. But first, here's the wonderful Sandy King to provide us with some historical context. Raymond, there have always been the few radical voices raised in the cry for reparations from Marcus Garvey to the Nation of Islam, whether the demand was for land or money, the idea has been the same, that a nation built on forced free labor does have a debt to pay. The difference these days is in where those voices come from. Academia and art and even the halls of Congress. But Oscar Brown Jr. may have put it best back more than 30 years ago. If I am not mistaken, I once read back during that short spell I spent in school where every slave set free was supposed to get for slaving. 40 acres and a mule. It's a question that's been asked in black America for well over a century. But lately it's had a new frequency and fervor. I want my 40 acres and my mule. You know, a year and a half ago, this issue wasn't being discussed at all. And now it's discussed everywhere. And especially on college campuses. A speech at Rutgers one night, a heated debate at Princeton the next. The controversial topic, reparations for slavery. The U.S. government was enriched by slavery. It has a debt, and the debt must be paid. Does that make sense to anybody in this room? Are you all bright people? It is stupid. It is politically insanity. The only people that serve are the leaders of this movement. One of those Here's leaders, Trans Africa founder Democrat. Randall Robinson, a prime mover Bob in the struggle to free now. South Africa, now a Here's fervent voice in the movement government. for reparations. When a government commits crimes against a people, that government, pursuant to law and notions of common morality, precepts of ordinary decency. That government is obliged to make the victims whole. It's a case that was repeatedly made in the years that followed emancipation. Legislation introduced in Congress in 1866 and 67 that went nowhere. And 22 years later, still another bill rejected in the Senate. 
There was never restitution, and another six decades would pass before the descendants of slaves would gain anything close to the status of full and first-class citizen. Africans and African Americans were caused to endure the longest running crime against humanity in the world over the last 500 years. But conservative columnist David Horowitz, who's mounted his own campaign to fight reparations, insists it makes no practical or political sense. There's no way to make up for the crime of slavery or of segregation or of discrimination. It can't be done. 40 acres and a mule was not enough. There's, no, there's nothing that's really enough if you've been enslaved. But all the slaves are dead, and all their children are dead, and probably all their grandchildren are dead or near death. But their descendants number more than 35 million, many of whom still suffer the impact of centuries of officially blessed abuse and discrimination. Either we are innately inferior, and there's no science to support so ludicrous a notion as that, or something happened. There's no question that something happened. And it happened for 346 years. So not only has Robinson written a book which states the case for reparations, he's also become a central figure in a group of lawyers like Johnny Cochran, scholars like Cornell West, and activists like Dorothy Lewis, who are talking reparation strategy and maybe a multi-trillion dollar lawsuit. We begin to think about what we will require in our court suits that would, over four generations or so, pull the victims of slavery and a century of discrimination that followed it to parity in America. But while it's mostly blacks who've been talking reparations, there is some talk among whites as well, talk that tends more than not to be in opposition and from the right. Up. This is not, the world is, cannot be uh, solved by these stupid formulas. The reality is every group in America, no group as much as black people, but every group in America comes, you know, they've had injustices committed against them. It's one of the reasons people come to America. I do not believe that reparations are just for African Americans. I think that reparations will benefit all Americans. I've been asked if my book is dividing us when we never were united. That one cannot be, a community cannot be united in inequality. I'm not saying this to see folks sweat, because I'm not bitter, neither am I cruel. But ain't nobody paid for slavery yet. About my 40 acres and my mule. Like most of those who've signed on to the concept of slavery reparations, Randall Robinson says the form they should take has yet to be determined. But while Horowitz and his fellow conservatives raise the specter of individual cash payments to every black person, including Oprah Winfrey, the fact is that the mainstream of the reparations movement is calling instead for institutional funding. What some describe as a kind of trust fund for longtime serious programs, especially those that might make a real difference in the areas where the black white gap is greatest education and economic development. But for the last 11 years, Detroit Congressman John Conyers has been unable to convince his colleagues that the concept should even be discussed. So is there a chance for reparations? And should there be? Two very different answers coming up from activist Ron Daniels and writer Stanley Crouch. You'll want to stay with us. For the pain and heartache, I don't even think they can pay us for that. We have built America, and we still haven't been paid for it. I think we deserve to be paid for it. 
you give him one dollar's consideration and an apology. That's what? it. That's not a bad idea, but where does the money come from? That's always the biggest problem with most things in life. I'm the richest country in the world, and I think that the black people need special attention. They need a, a jobs, they need a good apartments, they need uh, health care. I think we need to go deeper and see how far back we, um, the money goes for everybody. It happened a long time ago. I mean, I've never been slavery. They don't owe me a dime. I think they have it pretty good. I don't think they're suffering. What are they suffering from? We know that African Americans have not had their rightful share of the American pie, and yes, I think it's about time we got it. And though there is no monolith that is black opinion, polls show that as many as three quarters of African Americans think that some form of reparations is in order. Ron Daniels, executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights and former director of the National Rainbow Coalition, says that's only right. But journalist and critic Stanley Crouch is not so sure. I thank you for joining me. It's great to have a chance to talk about this with two good friends. Ron, let me start with you. What's the most powerful, compelling argument for reparations for slavery? Well, I think the most powerful and compelling, compelling argument is historically whenever a nation has been guilty of uh, slavery or Holocaust against another people, it has been well established in international law that they have a right, they have, a, they have an obligation and a duty to repair that harm. That's what reparations means. And of course, uh, perhaps the most compelling example in recent history is the way in which Nazi Germany or Germany and Poland and, and, and any number of countries had to make restitution to the Jews for uh, the Holocaust of, of, of in, you know, in Nazi Germany, where some six million Jews lost their lives in a concentration camp. So that set a, a very powerful precedent. And the notion of repair for damage done is the, is the key question. Now, Stanley, Ron's example talks about the Holocaust reparations, which involves repair to the actual people who suffered and from some identified corporations, as well as from uh, the German government at an earlier point. Does that give you any feeling about whether or not it makes sense to talk about reparations for African American slavery here? Well, my biggest problem was not with the idea of any kind of money being used to deal with very serious problems because there is a body of problems that have to be addressed. The biggest problem that I have is that I just don't think white people are going to go for it. So you don't think it's doable? I don't think it's doable, and I also think, and I, and I also think that um, you can you, you can run the risk of creating the the emotion that gets in the way, which is the three of us go someplace and and, and we pass some white woman and she takes the person, <gasps> and then we say, well, wait a minute, what's going on? I mean, he's sitting here, you know, and then she says, well, you know, a friend of mine got her purse snatched by three black guys about your age, uh, about six months ago. Now, the problem is... So, Lisa, so you're saying not only is it not doable, but that it could create a negative social dynamic? I think so, but I think that what we need to get, that, to get our problems taken care of is recognition of the fact that as Americans, we, Randall, we as Randall Robinson did say, and I think he was correct about that, if we do better, the country does better. But, but I think that, that I just don't think that, I don't think they're going to go for it. I think it would be better to try to get if, if we could get some trillions, I think it'd be better to try to get some trillions another way. Well, you see, the first, the point, first point, Stanley, is that we have to deal with the veracity of the claim. The improbability is not the question. I mean, who would have thought that this country would have, in fact, there would have been a Martin Luther King bill? I mean, for years, people thought that was improbable because of who King was and so forth and so on. So I think the claim is correct. Once we've established that, the question is how do we get it? And one of the most brilliant ideas that has been developed, by, was developed by Congressman John Conyers and Cobra and others working together. By in Cobra, I mean the National Coalition of Blacks. Well, let me stop you for a moment before you get into the specifics of, of the Conyers approach, which is, is there not yet a significant challenge, not to workability, but to the moral claim? No, no, not, well, it may I mean, be. Are there, there does seem be. to be, I mean, for example, Mr. Horowitz, who we saw in the clip earlier, is maybe typical of at least one group oh, of conservative huge. critics who essentially say there's not a moral distinction between African Americans and early immigrants who may have struggled. Well, that's preposterous. But it's an argument that's made? Well, it's an argument made. That's why education has to confront that. And I think you also, you confront it with education and you also confront it with organized power because you need both of those in order to, to make the case. But I mean, there's, there's no way of comparing the, the enormity of the a catastrophe and the genocide of the, the African Holocaust 
with what immigrants suffered. I mean, they just don't compare. But, but forget well, furthermore, it. Right. furthermore, I have to say this. I know David Horowitz, I think he does some valuable things because he attacks some fraudulences out there. But quite frankly, people whose history in the United States does not go back more than 100 years, perhaps, I don't really care what they think about what happened in the United States between 1619 and 1900. But doesn't no, I, don't, fact, I, don't think, I don't think they shouldn't be able to talk. But doesn't the mere fact that so many people who are not African Americans embrace that view affect whether or not it's possible to advance the political. Of course political. it is, but, 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 the, but the, the challenge is to educate and to bring people to the table. I'm not sure that many people were persuaded that the Japanese ought to have reparations. The, the Japanese who were in the internment yes, camps. Yes, who were interned in the, in the concentration camps. The decisive factor there had to do more to do with United States relations, I think, with Japan and the power of those investments. So my point is, people don't always do what they ought to do simply because it's the right thing. I think it's a question of moral suasion and education, but organized power, both in the political arena, in terms of the ability to exercise economics. There's a whole thing, a number of things that we need to do. The first thing that we needed to have done, and we've done it relatively successful, is to persuade ourselves as African people in this country that there was a veracity to the claim. I've been in, involved with the reparation movement now for all of my adult life, and I, there was a time when you, if you said reparations, you'd be laughed out of the room by black people. And when did you think the turning point came? Well, I think the turning point's been in the, la in the last 15 or 20 years, really. There have been these, these spurts. Conyers introducing the bill, uh, State Senator Bill Owens introducing a bill in Massachusetts. Randall Robinson's book in the last two years. Well, Randall, I, I, I think his, his, his book has been really huge in that regard, but I think the groundwork has already sort of been plowed up in the African-American community by groups like, again, in Cobra. Let's look at whether there's been movement, Stanley, in terms of the larger society. Uh, the current issue of Vanity Fair, while it has Jennifer Lopez on the cover, has a lengthy piece by Christopher Hitchens about reparations inside. Current New York Times, a lengthy piece again describing the issue. Uh, does that mean that there's just kind of a, a pornographic intrigue with it, or that there's really a serious debate taking place in mainstream America, not just in African America, about reparations? Well, I think, well, the first thing is this, I think that all of it's connected, uh, however big a lie and a fraud Alex Haley's uh, roots was, a plagiarized work, the television depiction of the, of the beginnings of slavery, which was essentially fraudulent to the idea that Africans were being kidnapped out of a park and taken over. Uh, but once people actually had to look at the Middle Passage, the whole plantation system as uh, one white woman told me back during the roots days she said well, you know she said she said my mother is a hardcore racist she said but even she okay after, but, don't just let me finish okay. after seeing roots she said now I understand what their complaint is now I'm saying that given what Ron was talking about that that groundswell part of the groundswell comes from the fact that people actually now know that slavery was not the way it was depicted in Gone okay. with the Wind or in Song of the but South. But even if we view it roots, wasn't zippity doo even business. if we view roots as part of an epiphany, though, certainly the growing antagonism to affirmative action, however ill-defined that is in, in broad social commentary, would suggest an opposition in society that's pretty deep to the idea that you need to make good on promises to freedmen or even subsequent harm under Jim Crow uh, to African Americans. Well, another way of looking at it, however, it could well be that reparations could be seen as a part of a new, what I call a new covenant for. A new society. That is to say, some people may say, well, we're opposed to affirmative action, but let's deal with this reparations question once and for all. And if there's a way in Who, which Ron, we... Give, what kind of people or what specific people can we talk about? Not names, but types of people who are saying that. Well, I think I think they're well. I think if the polls are indica any indication, that's eighty-five percent of no, ninety-five percent of America. Why okay, these are black away. folks. But I'm saying in the broader society, are there people who may not be comfortable with affirmative action, but are at least willing to talk directly about reparations? Conservatives might say that. Conservative, even Horowitz, notwithstanding, there could be a case to be made for let's deal with this issue of the inequities and in, in, in between white America and black America once and for all, and that reparations is one way of putting together a drive engine to deal with these questions. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that argument, but I think some might be. No, well, Charles Krauthammer okay. and wrote, a, wrote, a, wrote a column in which he supported the idea, which was startling to a number of people. He said, he said this, it's, it's, it's undeniable that something special happened to this group of people in the United States, and they should be compensated in some way. But let me give you a smaller example. We do a man in the street 
clip that you saw before we got started with our conversation. We sent uh, Henrietta Parker, who's an African-American woman who can usually talk to anybody. We couldn't get people other than African-Americans to even talk to her about this issue until we sent Jeff Friedman, our executive director, out, uh, who at least got some comments, some of whom you heard, the dollar and apology, for example. Uh, so it doesn't sound like, from our unscientific approach, that there is a sense in the body politic at large that we really want to wrestle with this idea. Yeah, but it's still, but see, Again, my problem is not trying to get some money. My problem is that I think that finally the people who make the who are most important to the future of Afro Americans are the white people. And that is to say that if we get them, then we're okay. And if this can be seen as something that's focused specifically on on, on objectively observed problems and that monies are used based upon programs that do work. See, here's the biggest but, problem you got. Sam, so you're favoring mean? reparations? No, no, I'm not talking, I, I don't care what they Because mean. it seems to me you can do what you just said and it has nothing to do with reparations. It might even have nothing to do with race. Whereas this is a very race-specific idea based on people of African descent who were in circumstances. Yeah, well, you see, my problem is I don't believe, see, I, I think that, we, I, I think since everybody uh, loves to apologize today, particularly the Japanese who can bow and apologize to you and, and, and say screw you on the way back up, that doesn't mean anything to me. Now, they, you know, the president or something could come out and say, yes, we apologize, you're terrible. This is the thing. The poverty program spent more than a trillion dollars, and a lot of it was wasted, stolen, tied up in corruption, et cetera. Whatever we're going to do, if we're going to do something, we have to find objectively successful programs that can be replicated to deal with the problems in the schools, teenage pregnancy, illiteracy, drug abuse, street gangs, and the development of capital. Because the biggest argument you have for black Americans getting something is that we had 0.5 of the, of, 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 the, of, of the money in America 100 years ago, and now we have one well, point. Now, Ron, is any of this money going to Stanley? Because he got several million dollars. I mean, we're talking, I mean, Sandy, in our opening mentioned Oprah. How do you deal with the question of who well, gets well, it? Well, first of all, let me just deal with this. I mean, I I, I did have a few there days. has to be massive education. I mean, I'm not sure that there was anywhere near as much money squandered, quote unquote, in the, in the poverty program that was squandered in the SL scandal, for example. Or is that routinely a squandered But by, you're not talking about the the payments to finish. individuals, are you, in the context of the reparations could plan? could be a photo have? finish, Ron. Okay. Yeah, well, it may be. But my, <laughs> but point right. is, my point is, even if all that is true, that still does not detract from the claim. Right. And my view is that what we need to do with reparations, I'm not interested in individual payment. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in what was, I've been articulating strongly the view that was that was in your setup piece, mm -hmm. and that is that we, what we need is some kind of development fund, some kind of trust fund that would be administered by a group of... Are West Indians eligible? No. Well, wait, hold. Let, let, let me do it. I'm sorry, that's it's, it's corporate. See, we have to get around this individual question. Well, but if it's, it's a based, corporate responsibility. But if it's based on the concept of a harm done to Africans held in slavery here and their descendants, how then do you move that into an idea of, well, first of all, broader need? And well, if so, what does well, it have to do with Well, first of all, you get, away, you get away from individual payments. Okay. Because none of us are the direct, may not be okay. the direct descendants and so forth. Okay. So that, to me, that's a bogus okay. argument. It's a corporate responsibility. Just like you deal with Native Americans, you don't mm -hmm. say which Native Americans, what, you know. I mean, it, the, the land that was granted to Native Americans was to all all Native Americans, and indeed the Native brothers and sisters who were involved in the in, in the Caribbean and very other places in the world. And at the final analysis, the reparations movement what would, would you be do a with global those struggle. What would you do with the funds? Well, the funds would be administered. It would be a trust fund, mm -hmm. and you For? would in, you would invest it strategically. It could be around industries. It could be about education. It could be around. Uh, resuscitating the agricultural sector and, and the African community. There's a whole series of issues. That the could Oscar be Brown piece talks about per slave interest on per slave, per acre, and per mule. A part we didn't play. That's some people calculated maybe one and a half, two trillion dollars. A lot of money. It's How a big would you number. Decide where? It's a big number, but I don't think the number is important. I think what is important is the acknowledgement, the apology the whole Quentin's of penance and restitution. The restitution will be huge. It will be nowhere near what we are actually entitled to. But the point is, it can be used strategically to deal with the inequity between Africans in this country and others. Because the, de the, the, okay. the key questions here are the intergenerational benefits and intergenerational okay. deficits that accrue. Yeah, in our slavery. last minute, so let me ask you to do this. In the next 10 years, will we see something happen that we would agree was reparations, Ron? Not, maybe not in the next 10 years, but I think we're making significant progress down the road. So you think maybe in our lifetime, maybe 25 years? 25 years, yes. Okay. Stanley, in 25 years, will we see something that the three of us, if around, would agree that's reparations? Well, I'll tell you what, if we don't get it within the next decade, it's once the, once the, the Latinos become 
uh, my, uh, minority number one, they're really not going to be thinking about us getting a dime. So is that a yes or a no, Stanley? I'm trying to that's that if out. we don't get it in 10, mm -hmm. I don't know if we're going to get it in But if we don't get it in 10, we can just about forget well, it. Well, Randall's predicting it'll take Randall Robinson three generations to get there. Well, I think, I think, I think I, I've, I've actually written an article called Reparations Now or Never, and actually uh, along the same line that, that Stanley's doing. It becomes more and more difficult the more people who come to the country who are not aware of our history. Right. That's why the Conyers idea and the, You'll the, have to come back then in the next couple of years <laughs> so we can resolve it. Stanley, Ryan, Nine thank you. From now. That's it for this edition <laughs> of Deep Process. But for more of the same, more grown-up discussion of serious subjects, more cutting-edge issues of law and social justice, you want to join us next week. Till then, for Sandy King and all of us here at Due Process, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. layer of our society and they are replicating themselves faster than the rest of us the seeds of disaster are there and so when we talk about reparations and repairing people we're not talking about a dole to African Americans we're talking about the salvation of American society. Major funding for due process was made possible by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law. Additional funding was provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual.